And I think we can get started now. Aris, if you want to kick things off. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Haris Tareen, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Programming here at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I wanted to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this extremely important conversation. Uh, we call it the Nonprofit Killer Bill, but HR 9495 really is focused on limiting civil society, advocacy, and the space for dissent in, in our country. And so we wanted to bring together not only American Muslims uh, who will be impacted by this bill, but also our allies and communities who are standing on the right side of history to ensure that this bill does not pass the Senate, that we work together as communities of concern to push back against the limiting of free speech, the limiting of dissent, which is the core of what it means to be an American. And so our concern is to ensure that the, the civil society space is not impacted by this bill, that we work together with communities of all backgrounds to ensure that this does not pass. And not that only this specific effort, but all of the other bills, all of the other attempts by um, any administration, the current one, the incoming administration, and those who come after them, any attempts by them, by Congress, or even by other groups, um, third party groups, uh, any effort to limit the free speech and to limit civil society and the impact of civil society is pushed back again. So we again wanted to thank you all for joining us. We have a great lineup of speakers, of experts, experts and advocates who can talk about uh, the work that they've been doing and the work that we've been doing to ensure that this law does not pass the Senate, but at the same time that we push back on any other attempts to limit the free speech and the civic discourse um, of our of our group. So thank you again for joining, and I'll pass it back to you, Mohammed, so we can get started with the rest of the group. Thanks a lot, Harris. Um, and I'll introduce myself. My name is Mohammed Ali. I'm the Director of Legislative and Congressional Affairs here at the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and I lead all of our work um, on Capitol Hill. And thank you all for joining. I'll quickly introduce our panelists, starting with Catherine Tomaszewski. She's a, a Senior Legal Advisor at the Charity and Security Network. Ben Grossman Cohen, the Director of Campaigns at Oxfam America, Diala Kasim, Senior Legislative Assistant for Congressman Andre Carson, Kevin Ratchlin, the Washington Director for the Nexus Leadership Project, and Sumaya Wahid, Senior Policy Counsel, Muslim Advocates. So before we kick things off, or before we kind of talk about what happened on the House floor and looking ahead, I want to get, spend a little bit of time on what the bill is, what it does and um, how it can impact our community. So to start that, Catherine, if you want to share a little bit about the bill, the summary, and some of the provisions in it that are particularly harmful. Thank you so much, and um, thank you for having me. My name is Catherine Tomaszewski. I'm with the Charity and Security Network. We're a resource and advocacy center for nonprofit organizations focused on defending civil society space from overreaching national security measures. Uh, we work to protect and promote the ability of nonprofits to carry out effective programs that support human rights, peace building, and aiding civilians in the area of disaster and armed conflict as well. We first took note of the language in this bill actually over a year ago now, last November, when HR 6408 was introduced by the Ways and Means Committee. That's where this language came from. Um, and then nothing really happened with the bill until May when 6408 passed the House with broad bipartisan support uh, with both Democrats and Republicans and everyone kind of went, oh, wow, we need to start doing something about this. Um, and then at that point, a bunch of advocacy groups came together from all different parts of the nonprofit sector to uh, engage with the Hill and, and, you know, put out some advocacy on this issue. And we were able to stall the bill Senate in the Senate, the Senate version of the bill, which was 4136. And then after that, um, it went away for a while and then was resurrected in HR 9495, which is the Stop Terror Financing and Tax Penalties on American Hostages Act. The bill itself has different goals um, than 6408, where 6408 was solely this language. 
this bill uh, is simultaneously including this really harmful language with the other goal of stopping tax penalties on American hostages uh, to kind of push it through and make it something that's very difficult to vote no on. And so CSN, along with several other civil society organizations, many of which who are on the call today, uh, started doing some advocacy around this bill. I think the ACLU um, uh, submitted a letter with over 350 signatories. There was also a letter by CARE about this bill. So really we saw people from all different parts of the nonprofit sector and civil society come together to oppose the language in this bill. Why? Uh, because while this bill was originally crafted, this language was crafted to target pro-Palestinian organizations and student protesters, which is evidenced by Ways and Means Committee hearing transcripts. Um, this bill has the, the ability to be used to target a much broader swath of civil society. If the Secretary of the Treasury deems that an NPO is a, a nonprofit is a tax, uh, or sorry, a terrorist supporting organization, and then it can strip the tax exempt status of that organization. So what's the problem with this bill? Because on its face, that sounds like a good idea, right? Of course, you shouldn't have a tax exempt status if you are supporting a designated terrorist entity as a U.S. organization. Well, that's already prohibited. Um, so this bill is not only redundant, it's just unnecessary. Organizations are already, all people are permit, are prohibited under U.S. law from materially supporting terrorism under the Anti-Effective or Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act, the ATA, the Anti-Terrorism Act, and IEPA. Um, so there, it's, it's broadly prohibited already in the U.S. But what this bill does is create ways that, um, these powers can be further weaponized to target civil society by investing a really broad discretion in the treasury to determine that a charity is a, tax, a terrorist supporting organization, strip them of their tax exempt status. Um, and then of course, all sorts of things flow from that. So reputational harm, even if, even if you're able to prove that you weren't doing that and you lose your funding, et cetera. Um, so just a couple notes on what's in the bill, especially because when we engage on this bill and you look at the text of the bill, what we hear back a lot from members of Congress is, oh, but there's a there's a designation process here. I see that there's a notice period and an appeals process. Um, that is a facade of due process that is not meaningful recourse for nonprofits. There's a 90 day notice period where they just give you notice that this is happening. And then there's an opportunity to cure by which you as a nonprofit can say, no, I, I didn't do it. And then the treasury can either say, oh yeah, you didn't do it, or we're going to stick with our decision. There's no third party, uh, reviewing these decisions. There's no process. Um, so that's really important to notice. And also, I think most importantly is that the Treasury doesn't have to give nonprofits all the information that they have um, when they make this decision. It is kind of a secret evidence rule in here. So if they deem it in, to be in the interest of law enforcement or national security, they don't have to give you all the evidence that they're considering to designate you. And um, that's, you know, that's very different than if we're going, I'm a former defense trial lawyer, you usually get all the evidence in court from uh, the prosecution. So you know what's coming when you're being prosecuted for something like material support of a terrorist organization. This wouldn't be the case in this bill. So uh, broad ability to be abused, um, very tricky language that's meant to look like there's due process when there's not. And then lastly, the bill does um, conflict with existing law. We work with a lot of humanitarian organizations, peace building organizations who are working in conflict zones where they have to work with designated entities to get to innocent civilians or provide aid, provide peace building. They have to pay tolls. They have to pay utilities. That is allowed under current U.S. regulations by the Treasury under the Office of Foreign Assets Control. And this bill would directly contradict that sanctions law that we have in place. And I'll stop there. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, it's also worth noting that nonprofits, charities, they, you know, tend to run pretty lean when it comes to their budgets. And so to hire lawyers to defend yourself against the government accusing you of supporting terrorism, that's not a line item that exists. That has the potential for bankrupting many organizations that exist in this space. Um, 
so Maria, if you can uh, kind of speak to how this will have an impact specifically on the American Muslim community, those um, organizations like MPAC and others that kind of exist to serve um, communities of uh, Muslim faith. And, and, and so because it is seemingly targeting or based on the timing, seemingly targeting um, our community a little bit. Yeah, sure. Thank you um, for having me here. And um, I appreciate Catherine uh, providing that uh, uh, summary of the bill. And um, I just want to take a step back and, and note that this bill exists within a context and a history of counterterrorism law in the U.S., um, some of which um, Catherine mentioned um, that actually exists um, and, and is rooted in anti-Palestinian racism. Um, and this is documented by Palestine Legal and the Center for Constitutional Rights in a report that they released earlier this year that goes back to the 70s. Um, and uh, one of the laws that Catherine mentioned, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, um, is actually from the mid-90s um, and establishes the material support um, scheme that already, you know, that that is a reason that this bill would be redundant. Um, and uh, and that was passed in response to an act of terror by a white U.S. citizen, um, the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, but then the law that was passed in response to that targeted foreign terrorism. And then the first entity that was designated was Palestinian. Uh, and then the material support provisions um, uh, that uh, criminalize um, the material support to organizations that are designated those laws have been enforced disproportionately against Muslim charities. Um, and this is something that Professor Sahar Aziz has covered in her research. Um, and, and so anti-Palestinian racism and anti-Muslim bias are not the same thing, but they are mutually reinforcing and rely on some of the same tropes of um, our communities as inherently violent um, and supportive of terrorism, um, a word that I still don't even like to use um, because of that history. Um, but uh, given that history, our community is already aware of cases in which massive charities have been shut down, like the Holy Land Foundation in the post 9-11 era, um, based on material support provisions um, that criminalized even their humanitarian support um, because it went to Palestine um, and had to interact with um, entities that were designated. And so our community having known that that happened and that five of the officers of that foundation were thrown in prison, um, it already caused a chilling effect amongst our communities, um, both in terms of charitable giving, um, particularly internationally and in conflict zones, um, but also in terms of political statements that our organizations feel comfortable making. Um, of course, in the past year, um, with the ongoing onslaught of Israel against Palestinians in Gaza, um, the that we have also seen um, a, a real um, McCarthyite level of suppression against pro-Palestine activism, um, and um, in in this uh, in in the testimony around this bill, as Catherine mentioned, um, the Students for Justice in Palestine and American Muslims for Palestine were targeted, um, and so we we know that 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 chilling effect has already happened, um, but that this bill, if it became law, would just give a political appointee unfettered power to shut down charities. And that would include mosques, um, community organizations, grassroots organizations doing protest activity, um, or completely apolitical organizations that could be mosques or community centers um, uh, trying to provide um, humanitarian aid um, or even domestic um, aid uh, to folks who are refugees. Um, we um, there, there would really be no limits. Um, and that is the the concern with this bill and and that the the kind of racialized targeting of our communities as having some kind of nexus to terrorism. Um, we would expect that those accusations would be a lot more kind of believed and um, they'd be able to get away with it against our communities more than maybe in other communities. However, um, as the um, the massive um, outcry against this bill has demonstrated, um, nobody feels safe from the targeting that this would allow. Um, and so uh, and I think we can talk more about this, but certainly um, political opponents of whoever is is happens to be in, in the, um, the administration um, would be targeted because this bill is so broad and gives such unfettered power um, to the Treasury Secretary. So I'll stop there. Let's and it's, it's important to note that what you kind of ended by saying that this is this isn't a partisan issue that 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 Democrats can use this to their advantage to go after who they may think are, you know, conservative nonprofits or charities that they don't like. And this is a way to kind of, you know, 
uh, really kneecap the industry, kneecap those who are trying to engage the government in a meaningful way. And and so it's it it you know from our vantage point, this should be an issue for all those who are, who not only work in civil society but um, who are able to you know use civil society to be able to connect with their government. Um, now let's move on to the House. Um, Catherine, you had uh, kind of broken down the bills, the, the this concept as it existed in different iterations of 9495. Um, but Diala, if you could kind of talk about, you know, where it started to where it is in terms of how many votes it started out with, why it ended up with the number of votes that it did, and kind of the process from your from where you sit. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this bill passed out of Ways and Means Committee um, and came to the floor on a suspension vote. So there's a reason that we saw it come to the floor twice. Um, it came under suspension vote, and that means that two thirds of the majority of the um, of the of the of the Congress has to vote in favor of it. Um, and I think it passed or it failed 256 to 145 the first time around. Um, so then the second time it got it came to to the floor, um, it was not on suspension. It failed the first time. They thought, okay, we can get 50%, we can get 50 of the or half of the votes. Um, let's bring it back the next week. They brought it back the next week under regular um, order out of suspension which only needs 50% of the votes um, and it passed 219 to 184. Um, there, I think that there's, you know, talk about the difference of why there was 145 votes and then there was 184 votes, the change of votes for so many people. And I think that there are two reasons specifically for that. Um, the first one is just the fact, the mere, the mere fact that it's on suspension. So anything that is on suspension, we immediately as the staffers and for the recommendations and stuff think, okay, this is probably a good bill because it's bipartisan. There was no issues with this. It came out of committee and it's just on the suspension list, which is a quick two minute vote. Um, that is obviously not the case for every single bill, but generally these bills that are on suspension are ones that are non-controversial, quick to pass, moving on. Um, so uh, it, they're, they're not really talked about. So it kind of flew under the radar. Um, Luckily, it did fail, um, 256 to 145. Um, but I think that that's why you see a discrepancy between the two numbers, the 145 and then the 184 afterwards, because people were like, wait, why are we voting for this again? Why did it fail the first time? And then we had the second reason I think it, 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 um, it got such a higher number the second time around is because of the work of the organizations that were pushing, um, such as MPAC, such as uh, all of the other nonprofit organizations and think tanks um, laying out the exact reasons as to why this bill is not what it seems, right? On the face of it, I think you look on congress.gov and it just says, you know, tax penalties for hostages abroad, right? And you look at that as a staffer and you're like, oh, that sounds like a good thing that we should do. Um, but that's not the case. Uh, so I think that that's kind of the... Uh, the, what would happen on the floor. Um, I, I would be surprised to see the Senate take it up this Congress. Um, but again, we have a, a different Congress or a different Senate next year. So I do think that if it, if in the 119th Congress, um, it would probably pass the uh, uh, House again, that it would go to the Senate uh, Republicans. Um, and it could be uh, in a larger tax package as well. So I think that that it, that gives us time um, as a community to really push and educate on this bill. That way, when it does come around, back around, that 184 number actually becomes a larger number and the um, um, margins for the Republicans are super slim. Sorry, I think you're muted. I was saying it's a wonderful, perfect transition to what I wanted to um, ask Kevin. Um, what does it look like in the Senate for this Congress? And, um, you know, the process it would take the 60 votes, sometimes it's 50 votes. Can you kind of break that down a little bit? Yeah, happy to, happy to. So really quick, um, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, my name is Kevin Racklin. I'm the Washington Director 
for the Nexus Leadership Project, we engage primarily on the nexus of Israel and anti-Semitism issues. So the last year and a half has been a delight for me. Um, and this bill has been a nice breath of fresh air, if, if you can imagine that. But when it comes to the Senate and this and it's really a, a bill, I think it's important to remember uh, something that Catherine said originally when, she, when we started out was that this originally was two separate bills. Um, and in the House, they mashed it together. And so when you talk to the House staff that are leading this, um, a lot of them say we've taken four votes on this. We can't take a, a take a no vote on this. It was ridiculous because they they had it. But when you look into the Senate, it's actually even more stark. And because of the work of groups uh, in the Senate have really killed this bill, the original standalone bill um, in Senate finance, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, for the original version of the uh, tax, uh, the ta uh, the NGO bill, the new version HR ninety four ninety five would again be sent over to Senate Finance, um, and by all indications, um, it's not going to go anywhere. This uh, this Congress, it's just they don't. Uh, just to be very frank, they don't have the floor time. They don't have the time to actually move this legislation. They have. Uh, you know, the National Defense Authorization Act, they have the continuing resolution. Sorry, I'm going to say it's going to be a continuing resolution and not an appropriations bill um, that has to be passed before December 20th or else the government shuts down. There is a slew of judges that uh, Leader Schumer wants to push through um, before the end of the session as well. So there, there is legitimately not enough floor time for this bill to move along. But I think what's even more important, and I think the House vote and the work that all of our organizations, MPAC, uh, us and others out there that, you know, especially those on this call have done is that we alerted and, and showed the Democratic Party quite quickly and quite intensely why this bill was so dangerous. And I know for like, at least for the work that I do, I expanded it beyond from, you know, the center to the left to the actually the right part of the caucus to actually explain to them what this could actually do broader beyond, you know, the the Palestinian community and how it could actually impact other organizations and what a uh, politicized Department of Treasury in the next administration could do um, with language like this that is so broad and sweeping without any legislative checks on it. So it's really critical. Um, and going into the 119th, um, I think it's absolutely critical that the work that we have all done and the work that, you know, MPAC, uh, uh, sh shared uh, uh, charity and security networks and others, the work that we have done to educate, we have to keep that going because there is that inclination, as uh, as Diallo said, that, you know, oh, making sure NGOs can't give material support to terrorist organizations. Good. Move on. Um, it seems at face value to be a very easy yes vote. But at the end of the day, once you dig into that legalese, once you actually explain to them and carry it out and show them the examples, it immediately dawns on them why this is actually so dangerous, and particularly in the hand of a administration that has made already vows to attack, you know, all these other organizations and, you know, quote, enemies of their things. And this is kind of that first step. And I also, you know, before I, I kick it back over to you, Muhammad, I do want to kind of briefly bring out that even though this bill was created in a bipartisan manner and it was created before the release of Project Esther at uh, Heritage Foundation, it is a bill that could have been written and put into the Project Esther uh, plan from the Heritage Project because it is a vast expansion of executive authority um, to, it, as a purposeful mean to attack enemies of the quote unquote state. And this is the this is exactly what when we look at Project Esther and the uh, how it works to erode civil society, how they you know say that they want to combat anti-Semitism when in reality it's just about punishing those on the left, those who support Palestinian rights, um, and those who you know may have an issue with the president. That this is kind of that first salvo, um, and it's it's really sad that it's coming from the 118th. Um, and so I think going into the 119th, I think the the important thing. Uh, particularly because, you know, we lost, you know, even though we lost the vote, it was a win um, in the House because of the shift of the number of people. But it's really critical that Democrats understand the implications of this bill and hold firm and continue to grow those numbers to not give an inch when it comes to civil society, uh, uh, shutting down civil society. Thanks for that, um, Kevin. Um, you know, you talked about growing the ensuring that that number goes up so that it does not you know move forward and part of that requires mobilizing communities mobilizing those 
who would be opposed to it and just kind of educating that. And I know, somebody you wanted to kind of share some thoughts on what that took to get to where we are now and, um, you know, the coalition that did eventually materialize. Yes, thank you. And I'm sure others will have um, thoughts to add, but uh, the the timing at which the House attempted to kind of sneak this through on suspense was right after the election. Um, and I think that that timing helped a lot of different civil society groups really feel keenly how big of a threat this bill is. And so um, I saw an alert that I sent out very briefly to whatever listservs that I was on get forwarded to other listservs and um, and then heard, you know, that like tens of thousands of people were taking action. And um, I think people understood in that moment that, you know, a power grab for the executive is never a good idea, but um, particularly when people are concerned about um, authoritarianism uh, with the next president, um, that 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 timing really hit people hard um, and hit different. Um, and and I would just say that um, kind of looking ahead. Um, in, in terms of um, what we can think about uh, with the new Congress, um, there are going to be um, a crop of new legislators who um, have won in very, uh, by very slim margins. And so um, it will be important to meet with them and um, educate them about um, the concerns your community has about the bill, especially if you're a constituent group. Um, and and then I, I know somebody mentioned this in the in the chat, but we are working across different um, sectors and different um, identity organizations, um, but to continue that. Um, and I think that, you know, in, in my work on this, I've, I've worked with folks from a variety of different contexts, but environmental justice, um, uh, the movement for black lives. Um, and then immigrant justice organizations that have already been targeted in different ways, um, and including by, you know, state attorney generals um, uh, uh, for their work, for their First Amendment protected work, um, recognizing the threat that this um, bill, and if passed into law, would, would pose. And so um, I, I, I think it's really important for us to be in community and um, solidarity with organizations across um, those different issues that um, and, and representing communities that we expect to be attacked by the next Trump administration. Um, and, and this bill is just one example of why. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question to the group at large before we kind of get into some of the strategies on how to engage specifically, um, you know, both the Senate now, but the future Congress as well. Um, you know, a lot of times there's a frustration between what the public feels in terms of sentiment towards a bill or a concept or an idea versus what um, elected officials are actually doing. But in this case, you know, it would start it out with just a few, maybe a dozen or so members voting against turn to what we just kind of what we uh, saw Jala describe. Um, do we, how would you kind of explain to the folks who are listening and who kind of want to be engaged in the process, how much of an impact actually calling your the sort of the proverbial call your member made in this case from what seems like an innocuous slash no brainer vote vote for the terror financing because we don't like terror financing to where it ended up how much of an impact did that make i think it makes a really big impact um i think every person in the office can feel it when the phone is constantly ringing um and you know after one or two interns and the staff is picking up the phone because the phone is ringing off the hook, people in the office realize that this is an important issue. So I think the last time that this happened um, in, in our office, for example, with the, the social security bill that came to the floor, the phone was just ringing off the hook, right? So it was just like, okay, we need to do something about this because the constituents are calling about it. I think the same thing happened with the ceasefire um, bill as well. And I think I talked to many staffers across, you know, Republican and Democrat, where the phone was just constantly ringing about joining the ceasefire resolution. So I think we need to keep up that same, um, uh, that same effort, because it's, it's definitely felt, I think, within all the offices. So Ben, I'm going to turn to you, would you say that calling your member, calling your congressman, or senator, it works? In this case, is this an example of how it worked? Yeah, I mean, I think the example that was offered earlier where, you know, from speaking as a staffer, you know, you look at a bill and it seems relatively innocuous and, you know, maybe haven't spent a lot of time. There haven't been hearings that you're you've been involved in and to get the onslaught of calls and communications and letters that uh, show that actually people are paying attention to this and that this 
uh, is more complicated maybe than you initially thought, it makes a huge difference. And that's one of the things that triggered the, the change in votes. You almost never see votes flip so quickly. I mean, there was two votes, one right after another on the same bill, and many members switched. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, pretty strong evidence that the mobilization and the up outcry had a, a direct result. Um, and especially in this moment when many people are feeling um, uns unsure about whether they can still have an influence on what happens in their government, just to see evidence directly in front of their face of, you know, a bill came out, they raised their voice and a vote changed. I, I think that's a really important lesson. Would you, do you have any strategies to share uh, in terms of best practices when it comes to either organizing or um, kind of how best to get a hold of your member? I think, you know, the, the evidence that we've, we've heard is that when the phones are ringing, that's the strongest thing you can hear as a staffer in the office. But any time that you are able to, you know, contact your member, whether it's through email, which somebody receives and has to respond to, or an old fashioned letter or on social media, anything you can do is, is useful. Um, I think with uh, things like this, often people who are very engaged, you know, they feel like they're doing that all the time. So actually the thing that you can be most useful is, is talking to your friends and family about it, telling people who are not very engaged or who would be engaged on a different issue, but they're not really aware of this particular issue. Um, you know, that's always something that, you know, organizing the people in your Im immediate vicinity is going to be extremely valuable. And, you know, it doesn't take that many calls for it to feel like uh, the phone is ringing off the hook. So it is really the case that um, you can, as an individual, change the outcome if you are doing your part to make a phone call and telling your friends and family to do the same. I like the friends and family concept because I feel like this is an issue that affects all of us in ways that perhaps many of us may not even know. And so when we are looking ahead into the next Congress, um, and this is kind of a, a question for, for, for the entire group, where, what do you see happening here? Do you think it'll get put onto the, the tax extenders packages or do you think that there's, you know, or is this something that, you know, the incoming administration will be able to do by virtue of executive order? What do you anticipate? Um, I'll, I'll put it to the group. If you want to raise your hand or just kind of chime in. I definitely cannot predict uh, yeah, what the what the Republicans are going to do. They will do. I don't know. I mean, it's week by week, I think, here um, yeah. of, of how things will go. Um, but I mean, I think it would be the smartest way to pass it is to put it on a tax package. Um, I think if I was a Republican who was trying to get this passed, that's what I would do. But again, I can't um, predict what they're going to do. Um, in terms of, just to follow up on the last question that you asked about what you should do when you're contacting your member of Congress, yeah. it takes one minute to call them. And also don't only call when you're mad about something, call also when you're happy about something. Like we hear those calls too of like, Thank you, Andre Carson, for voting for this. Right? We need. I think that the staffers also need to hear. Okay, I this was a good vote recommendation on our end. Look at the phones blowing up. Right? Look at all the thank the thankfulness and support that we're getting from our constituency. And this that also helps, not just the angry calls all day long. So um, it goes both ways. And then remember, the person who's on the other side is usually an intern. So usually have a clear ask of what you're asking of vote no on this, and you know. I don't think it needs a five minute yelling session. <laughs> um, I was I was on the front desk during right after Obamacare passed on the Senate side and those one or two calls uh, saying thank you really went a long way. So I would definitely echo that. Uh, Kevin, I know your hand was up. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on the on the on the injured thing, please be gentle. I can't tell you the number of times that I sit in offices waiting for a meeting and I could literally hear people yelling at the staff. On the, on the phones in the front, uh, it doesn't help. It doesn't make anyone happy and it doesn't work. Um, but I will say this, I, I do know that so many offices that had voted yes prior and switched to no, which was about over 50 of them, um, they didn't do that because it, they felt, you know, they, that they wanted to out of the goodness of their hearts. You know, always, a, you know, flipping votes is always a difficult thing and it requires a lot of lifting and a lot of head work. And I think 
the the biggest thing you know just in terms of recommendations on this i would say the best thing i could say is don't accept no as an answer i can't tell you the number of offices that told me oh no i, I voted for this three to four times i'm like i don't care i'm like this is the new vote it's a new day uh, it doesn't matter and you have new information you have to evolve your positions so it's important to to meet them where they are but also to keep pushing until the last second um unless it's a hard thing in terms of next congress um i i personally could see um, Republicans continuing to use this as a bludgeon on Democrats. It's an easy punch um, that they can kind of continuously bring back up. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of the executive order, I don't know if they could do that, but I do think that if it were to pass Congress, it'll pass on the tax extenders uh, bill. I think that's the most likely vehicle um, for it to move on because it is, you know, it is germane. Um, and so it can actually work that way. But I think, you know, in terms of, you know, I think for Republicans, it's a good bill to you know, that if you're going to do the tax extenders package, it's a good bill to do because you'll get it'll be almost completely partisan, and they can point to Democrats, you know, wanting to finance terrorists, um, and they can kind of just ring that bell over and over again on the on this vote. Um, it's completely disingenuous and ridiculous, uh, but you know that's what the party has become at this point. And when you say Germain, you mean relevant to the bill at at baseline, and therefore only needing fifty votes? Is that right? Yes. Um, so, you know, so Maria, I, I know you wanted to also kind of share a little bit about um, kind of building the coalition going into next Congress. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, like I said, I think that um, given the challenges if this is um, attached to a tax bill, um, that uh, a, 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 an area of opportunity is the new um, Congress members um, and, uh, and then in terms of building the coalition, really looking at the charitable sector in your community um, and uh, understanding that this affects everyone um, and building a cross issue area, um, kind of like you see in, in our groups here. Um, but I, you know, I, the, the folks that I had mentioned before are um, more considered on the left side and, and more likely to be targeted targeted by the Trump administration. So that's like immigrant justice, um, movement for black lives organizations. Um, uh, but I think that, uh, and then environmental organizations. Um, but I think that um, again, maybe from the libertarian um, perspective or from or, um, organizations that might feel like they would be targeted under a democratic administration that we can build those relationships. I might not be the best messenger for those um, kinds of um, outreach, but um, you can find that within your community and um, build upon that. And I see other folks have their hands up, so I'll let them speak. Ben, I'll go to you next. Thanks. Uh, not to get into the weeds on the the like process on the Hill necessarily, but I do think there's still a question as to whether the bill would be eligible under Senate reconciliation rules for the tax bill, which is what you need to get it to be part of that and to allow them to only pass it with the majority uh, in the Senate. And so one of the key things is ensuring that there are not enough Democrats in the Senate that will allow this to get above the 60 vote threshold. That's sort of step one. Um, you know, if Republicans decide to try to pass it through the tax bill, they'll need to make sure that it can get in the tax bill. But there are a few other bills like the National Defense Authorization Act, which tend to sort of pass every year regardless. And if they figure out, um, you know, if they manage to amend that bill with this in it, that's another way that they can get it through. And again, there, the question is whether this, the Democratic leadership and allows that to happen. And so the Democratic leadership has some ability to have a, an impact on this if we can avoid the situation that, that Kevin and others talked about of this going into a tax package. So there is, I think, still ground to, to win on this, although it's a much higher uh, threshold than, than it is under this Congress because of the partisan flip. Catherine, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on the points about um, coalition building, because I think that this bill has been a really good opportunity for everybody to see the power of what happens when different sectors of civil society come together um, and align on our messaging. This is something that CSN has worked on really, um, really hard over the past couple of years in our communications with the Treasury Department, because we work a lot on financial access 
issues for nonprofits. And we found that when we all get together before we meet with Treasury and we say the same thing over and over again, that then our results are exactly the wording or, you know, as close as the wording as we want, we, we would like it to be, we can, we can get that. So um, just an example is, and everybody on this call is, is welcome to email me and, and join, but CSN started a listserv called Legislation Targeting Charities um, back in May when 6408 kind of blew up. And that really, that listserv started gaining members from not just the humanitarian and peace building sector or faith-based organizations, but also immigration organizations, reproductive rights organizations, environmental organizations, everybody who saw the potential of this bill to be used to target civil society. And it also really allowed us to look at the bill in different ways and how it could impact people differently so we can align our messaging. Um, so I think that that's important when doing congressional outreach too, and that's really powerful. And so just a note on that for, for coalition building and going into the next Congress, not only will we desperately need to lean on each other capacity wise for what's coming, but also um, it's just more efficient if we're all working together uh, and engaging on, on the same talking points and supporting each other because the first organizations and and targets of this bill, if it were to pass, it's going to be the people they said they were targeting, which is Palestinian organizations, student protesters. And so it's important for other members of the nonprofit sector to defend those organizations too, um, and make sure that they are not just thinking about their, their own part of the sector, but how when others are impacted, it impacts them too. Right. I think a vibrant civil society is, you know, one of, is, is often cited as the as a kind of indicator of the strength of one's democracy. Um, ben, could you speak to the timing a little bit going into next Congress? I know that we've kind of talked about the Senate, you know, it's looking like it may not move uh, this this month. And so we're, we're looking into January. Is that when can we expect this to actually uh, start moving? Ben, go ahead. I don't know, he may be frozen. Um, but for, for anyone else, uh, kind of, oh, Ben, if, if you're back, perhaps you can go to you or whoever else kind of speak to the timing of, you know, it seems like we've just, we've had, you know, four or five votes on this in rapid succession. And if it doesn't come up in December, it's, you know, when is it going to come back up? How do we kind of mobilize in advance? Do you start calling your members in advance of anything even moving? How do you kind of approach that? Yeah. Sorry about my internet. Um, um, uh, uh... It depends on, on the Senate side if they decide to put it in a tax package. They're actually fighting amongst themselves on the Republican side about whether a tax package will happen right away or uh, at the end of later in later in 2025. They're trying to get it done next calendar year. So I think the answer to the question is is just immediately, honestly, because it could happen at any time. And on the House side, it might be slightly different from on the Senate side. They will have to pass it in both houses again if it does not pass this session. And so, you know, getting ahead of the process and ensuring that there is not support, especially, you know, among Democratic leadership to to move this and allow this to move in something, you know, that's un unrelated. Uh, I, I think, you know, the time is really from now. So going into next Congress, I think that Republicans um, will, based on a couple of uh, folks going to the administration will have may, perhaps a one seat margin, I, I was reading. And in the Senate, you know, obviously, sometimes it'll take 60 votes, but only a couple of senators can really have a, a, a meaningful impact. Are there are there offices that you've seen to kind of really take a leadership role that you you think, you know, watching and following their lead and being supportive as, as supportive as possible of their efforts that, that you would recommend to uh, our audience to kind of really pay attention to? Both on the House side or the Senate side, and this is for the the you know uh, the whole panel. I mean, there's Thomas Massey, um, who has over and over <laughs> somehow been on the right side of this. <laughs> um, so I think he is an office to you know keep keep support, keep uh, you know calling them and have showing your support um, on the way that they're voting, even if it may not be for the same reasons. Um, but then there's also, um, I can't think of any other Republicans, honestly, that we work closely with on this specific issue. Um, I can think of Nancy Mace, who was a co-sponsor of our um, Aid Day, uh, was it the Aid Days Act? 
or yeah. one of the Muslim American bills, which was surprising to me. She was the only Republican that signed on to um, a bill like that. So either it was an accident or um, there is a staffer in there that is trying to get more involved with the Muslim community. So she, something to keep in mind. Carolina? <laughs> huh? In South Carolina? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I believe so. South, the South Carolina. Carolina, Kentucky Republicans. And those, you know, like make sure you call those offices and say thank you and continue the good work, though I don't think Mace was on the right side of this issue, but hopefully she can be in the future. Yeah. Um, any others on the Senate side in terms of mobilizing at the state level? Obviously, you know, California, New York, Texas, those states, you kind of know where their senators are going to be at any given time, but that's not the entire picture. So for our audience coming in from different parts of the country, who are some of the key players in the Senate that definitely, you know, more calls is, is something that could actually yield results. And this is a question to everybody. And I can maybe kick things off. If you look at, you know, in North Carolina, Tom Tillis, he's up for re-election. Uh, so, you know, there's a question of, is he gonna get primary from the right? Is he gonna be able to, you know, fend off a, a Democrat in office? So he's gonna have to balance kind of this, 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 you know, um, uh, balancing both both sides, and I think there's others perhaps who would be interested in bucking their party. And this, this, you know, if 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 the engagement is there, this could be the issue that they decide that will stand up for for democracy, if you will. I think you know one of the things that you can be focusing on directly. I think you you mentioned Tom Tillis, but I think any Senate Republican that's up for election in 26 is a prime target. I also think in the House side, and Diala, you can correct me if you, if, please tell me if you think I'm off base here, um, the new Dems, actually, than anything else. Um, they're going to be led this coming Congress by Brad Schneider, who is the uh, one of the leads on this bill. Um, and he has very strong thoughts on it. And so I, I would strongly uh, uh, recommend like you know trying to figure out how to deal with that office and to engage with as many new dems as possible because i think they're because they're in that weird blue dogish not quite blue dogish but you know wanting to be bipartisan um they are more inclined to support something like this um but again i think a lot of them just need to be educated uh on the bill overall I, that's a good point. And, you know, it's it's one thing where it was just a volume of calls that kind of got members to do the right thing. And this isn't a question for everybody. How much of it was just educating staff so that they could make the right recommendations from when it first came out to where it ended up? I think it's all about the calls. I mean, I, I think I can't remember. I think Ben maybe have said it. The first thing the staffer hears in the office is the phone just continuously ringing. Um, so if we're hearing the intern talk about this bill over and over and over, that immediately raises, I think, a flag of, wait, let me look into this bill. Why are so many people calling about it? So I think, I think it's a, I think it's a huge part of, um, a huge part of it, the, um, education around it, just because like, like we said over and over on the face of this bill, it looks fine. Everyone should get behind it, but then you actually go into the details of the bill and that's where the problem is. Um, so I think the education piece, we have to, I think, um, as soon as these bills are introduced as a, as a community, because the other side does this so well, um, is be on top of these bills. Um, you know, I think Catherine said that she, she tracked this bill a few years ago. Um, so I think from day one, education materials on these bills and what they do and why they exist and, um, how they're harmful that way as soon as it's starting to circulate, as soon as it gets to committee, everyone already knows what it's all about. So, I, you know, we one of the, the themes, the takeaways, if you will, of this conversation is that calls work. And it's something that we've heard from a lot of the panelists and I'm addressing the audience here. So, you know, when they say that democracy does not work, I think that this bill and the way that this the, the way that it evolved from the beginning um, earlier this year in the spring, where about 11 Democrats have voted against it, where to where it ended up, that's a product of advocacy. That's a product of folks calling their members or elected officials and saying, this is a bad bill. This is going to have a bad impact on us. And we want you to vote no. Very clear, very concise, and, um, you know, very, very certain about it. Um, I know we've had questions from folks about the impact that this could have on 
on people who either donate their time, their money, and otherwise to organizations should they be kind of put on a list or something like that? How, to what degree do donors of or, to organizations have to be worried? Um, and this is perhaps a question for the, the lawyers we have on, on the call or on the panel. Um, I can start uh, and would welcome comments from others. Um, this bill is really targeting nonprofits, um, but we do have, um, again, like we talked about the material support scheme um, that is about specifically um, designated um, uh, foreign terrorist organizations. And there's there's lists of those um, that OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, publishes. And so um, the the problem with that scheme is that it's it's intent doesn't actually matter. Like if you make um, a donation to a group that is designated, then it doesn't matter what your intent was. Um, or if you knew, um, then you, you know, you can you can be prosecuted anyway. Um, however, like those, um, there is some process, it's not like a criminal process where you have the same kind of standards um, for burden proof, um, but it, it's not as um, simple as what this bill would propose. And so I think that right now donors should not um, let fear just kind of um, uh, chill their their giving. However, do your due diligence. Make sure that um, you know your charity is registered and 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 all of that. Um, and you know and and consult. Um, you can consult an attorney if you, if you really are, are trying to make a big donation and and want to be careful. Um, I think that what I what what I don't want to happen is that people are scared from giving or speaking out because of bills like this. Um, because then the, the bill has done its work without even becoming law. Um, and um, and I know and I know that somebody put in a question about like changing their messaging because of bills like this. Um, and you know, I would discourage that because again, um, we do have First Amendment rights. Um, uh, you know, you do you should exercise caution in terms of <laughs> speech that isn't um, uh, um, pure speech and and I I, I don't want to get too too much into that. but, um, I would just say that um, uh, we have rights to speak out. We have rights to participate in in political activity. And um, if we all are silent, um, then that makes it that much harder um, to uh, push back against these kinds of initiatives. And um, and I think I'll, I'll go back to what Catherine is saying in terms of having a um, broad coalitions defending ourselves and each other. Um, part of that is, again, refusing to be silenced um, because we want to, um, the, the more of us that speak out, the safer it is for everyone. Thank you. Um, any final thoughts before I close this out? I'll say one thing, sorry. Yes, um, please. Just to point out that the, the timing of that bill was important and the number of Democrats that you saw, 180 for um, voting against it, what the timing was important because it was post-election. So we are in a year, we have a full year right now of it not being election year. So this is the like we this is where we really should be pushing our members to speak before things get even more political. Um, and yeah, I, I would definitely say that to all the organizations that you've really got this really good year ahead um, where everything can be anti-Trump. Everything can be, you know, because Democrats are going to get behind that. Um, so I think there's not that political fear of I don't want to go against my own administration. I don't want to go against my colleagues. I don't want to, you know, I have a um, a really important race that's coming up um, in two months. So use this year um, wisely. That's what I would say. That's that's really good advice, and I think transitions well to. Um, something that we at MPAC are about to release, and that is a resolution um, that we're going to request members of Congress to sign on to kind of decrying some of the abuses that could be um, carried out under this resolution or under the bill and asking them to sign on. And that would be sort of how we're approaching uh, going into next Congress so that we have them kind of sharing our ideals in terms of protection of democracy, the importance of civil society, and pushing back on some of the things that this bill is trying to do. So that will be coming out shortly. Um, if there are no other questions um, from the audience, and we've got answered a few of those, or anything else from the panelists, I will say thank you all and um, have a good rest of your day. Thanks again.